so excited. It just looks beautiful. Yummy, chef. Oh, goodness, that aroma is fantastic. Hey everybody, I'm Vera Stewart and welcome to The Very Vera Show. I'm so excited today to have as my very special guest, Brian Hart Hoffman. He's the Chief Creative Officer for Hoffman Media in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm so glad to have you back. <laughs> Thank you for having me. For those of you that have been with The Very Vera Show for a while, this is his third time on the show. Three is a charm. I, I think so. Absolutely. And you know, we are going to be making some very special dishes today. Tell us about it. So today is all about autumn vibes. We are going to start out with an apple cinnamon sugar donut bunt cake. That's a mouthful. But it screams fall. It is what you need right now to enjoy this amazing weather. And then you're going to teach me how to make your chicken pot pie. That's right. And then I've got some delicious pull apart pull apart milk bread rolls that are going to complete that meal and it's going to be a delicious table. And in Vera's corner today because we have the cookie expert with us, Brian is going to give us some tips on baking the perfect cookie. So you know what? We've got a lot to do. Why don't we get started? Let's jump to it. All right. Okay. This is a recipe out of your new book. It is. I am so excited about this cookbook. It is all about bunt cakes. And there's something about autumn time that makes me want to bake a bunt cake even more, even yeah. though it's a year-round thing and we have so many recipes that fit any season or celebration. Today's recipe with apples and cinnamon oh, and all I the fall it. vibes, it is it's just a, a recipe. Cool pan, I, and you know, that's what I love about Bunt Cakes is the pan does the beautiful work for oh, you. Oh gosh, well it's beautiful. Well, I had you busy during the break. So I did a few things to get us started. The first thing I did was I took some apple cider and I reduced it down so you get that amazing aroma in the kitchen down to a cup and a half. And then I needed to let it cool to room temperature so you really do want to start that about two hours before you're going to wow. bake the cake. So okay. that's, the, that's the hardest part, is getting started. All right. You've got the aroma in the house. Gosh. Then I went ahead in the stand mixer and I creamed our butter and sugar together. And then I added eggs and vanilla extract. And so that's where we are now. And, and everything was at room temperature. Yeah, I okay. work with all, you know, my eggs at room temperature, my butter softened. <laughs> we think alike. <laughs> okay, so now is kind of the fun part. This is when it's gonna all come together and it's so easy. Okay. In this bowl, I have all-purpose flour. And to that, I'm gonna add cinnamon, the star of the show today. I'm gonna add salt, baking powder, and baking soda. And that's all in, and I'm okay. gonna whisk these together. But I need you to combine our apple cider, our milk, and apple cider vinegar, so Ooh. that we can get started adding these to our stand mixer. Okay. So see, this is super easy, and you're just getting these ingredients combined. And then I like to add my ingredients into the stand mixer. Three additions of the dry ingredients, two additions of the liquid, so okay. I'm gonna alternate. Well, I've got it ready for you. All right, so I'm just gonna gradually add the first portion into the stand mixer, and then I'll Gosh, stop. I, I've got to try one of these apples. Oh yeah, you eat the apples, and then the cinnamon smell mm. over here. And see, here's this apple cider going in. Oh wow. And see, this is a batter that I really love. It is a very wet batter, mm -hmm. but that creates such a tender bun cake. And so the texture of this is gonna be perfect. All right, I'll save that for the last addition of our dry ingredients. Okay. Put the last bit of the liquid in. So when we're adding our dry ingredients, the last thing we do is we stop mixing in the mixer as soon as the flour is absorbed into the mixture. And so this helps us not overwork it. We want it to stay nice and tender. So about right here is perfect. Now there may be a little bit of flour that you see here on the paddle or even on this side of the bowl. But I'm just gonna shake that off and set it aside because now we're gonna add our apples. Oh, wow. Now here's a trick that I wanna share with everyone. I love this, y'all. This is my favorite apple trick. The recipe calls for a peeled and cored apple. You do need to core your apple, but I bake my apples with the skin on because it bakes for such a long time, the skin gets so soft and, and it really, you know, who likes peeling an apple? Nobody. Like, why do it when well, you don't actually, need to? Well, <laughs> actually, I peel apples for my husband every single night. So well, I could win, I could win a <laughs> apple peeling contest. Well, then Honestly. you can peel your apples for this recipe if you want. Oh, man. Then, I mean, that's the hard part. Okay, so this oh. is a, this, this is a, is how the, many cups? This is a 10 cup okay. bunt pan. And this is the Bavaria pattern from Nordicware. And I want to give a little buntology here. 
Buttology. Buttology. This is the technique you need to know. Never spray your pan with cooking spray. So many people talk about how a bun starts to stick, the pan, is there mm -hmm. something wrong? Most of the time it's because someone has sprayed it with cooking spray. You should always use a baking spray with flour. Right. So that will be great for these cakes to turn out beautifully and not stick to your pan. So then just add the batter to the pan. And then I'm teaching you a little thing or two today about my uh, Wolf steam oven. I cannot wait to bake this in the steam and oven. And honestly, you will not believe what this cake is going to look like when it comes out. Well, you know, First I time I ever did it, it had the perfect crown. Well, this one's going to be perfect too. So I'm going to show you one more tr buntology trick before we go off to the oven. I spread my batter in an even layer. Yep. And I tap it on the counter. That helps to get the batter in the grooves right. so that it has the beautiful pattern when you turn it out. Ah, well, we're going to get that in the oven at 325. It's going to bake for about an hour. And when we come back from the break, we're going to get started on me teaching him <laughs> how to make chicken, chicken pot, pot pie. pie. And I don't care, chicken <laughs> pot pie. So come back with us. <laughs> back everybody and if you're actually just joining me I'm with my good friend Brian Hart Hoffman he's president of Hoffman Media in Birmingham Alabama and they have like 10 different publications I mean everything from baking to Louisiana cooking to Southern Lady I mean just I've loved your magazines and publications Thank for you. years so glad you're here you've popped that cake in the oven it smells amazing. I mean, too, it by smells the way. so good in here, and we learned so many great tips. But um, I was kind of busy during the break. You know, there's no resting on the very, very show. So we're getting ready to teach you a little bit about chicken pot pie. You've already been with me during the break, getting this stuff together. Now, so, Vera, this recipe is actually in the hot off yes. the press issue of Southern Cast Iron. I, I mean, that makes me so. But I happy. have a question for you. The article says chicken pot pie and I don't care and we've been dancing and singing that today. You've got to tell us why. Oh my goodness. Well, back in the day, and I'm going to kind of walk you through this. Um, we used to, I mean, if I was busy at work and I was going to be late getting home and I would feel so guilty because I'm trying to raise my children and work full time, and if I couldn't make anything, I would always pull a frozen chicken pot pie out of the freezer. <laughs> well, if, if I felt guilty, then I thought, well, if I write a little song about it, then they'll <laughs> think this is really special. So that's where the chicken pot pie and I don't care came from. I love it. But they love the homemade version I of it. I was going to say, this one you. is really special. Absolutely. So this is butter that is melted. I've added in my onions and celery, got those tender. Then you start adding in your flour, your salt, your pepper, sage, and you just let it get to a nice consistency. Cook long enough to let the flour incorporate into the butter. And then I love to add the liquid slowly so that it actually thickens along instead of having to stand there and stir forever to get it thick. So that's exactly where it is right now. Do you think that looks good? It looks it looks great and it smells amazing too. <laughs> All right, so now you're going to add in the chicken and the frozen vegetables. And you know, you can get creative. This is all white meat, but we can also, you know, use the dark meat, which I love. And if you've got some vegetables maybe that you put up this summer, you know, um, recently I was in Wisconsin and we froze green beans. So those could actually be some of the beans that we did, you know, in the summer. But it's, it's just a really wonderful um, combination of things that everybody loves. So while you're stirring that, let me speak to what I did to get the pan ready. Now, you could make it in a pie pan, of course, but why wouldn't you make it in a Jed Curtis steel hand-forged pan? It is beautiful. I mean, isn't it beautiful? I want one. He, this guy is so talented. He's in Roanoke, Virginia, which is one of our newest markets for the show. So I want you to certainly check him out because it's amazing if you're looking for a special gift. So I took my already prepared um, Pillsbury rollout pie dough. <laughs> you were so funny. I said, where's the rolling pin? And we didn't have it. So you said, well, let's use a glass. And we just got it rolled out. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. A absolutely. And so we pricked the edges. And now you can go ahead and start adding in Look the filling. Look at that filling. beautiful Look filling. Look at that. 
you know, and if you want extra pepper, or like I said, you could be butter beans or whatever in there. But, you know, I love to use a different vessel, Brian. Um, you know, this way, I'm gonna actually have a presentation to make. You know, it's just a gorgeous pan. Um, you can use, a, a, you know, a cast iron, or if you've got a really unusual uh, casserole dish, you don't have to make it round. It can be a rectangle. You could cut it into squares. You just want now, the that's filling. Good. Surrounded by the dough. Oh, okay. So then I went ahead and cut my strips from the other dough that's in there. And I'm going to take the longest piece first. We may have to finish this during the break. But you start by doing all of your pieces one way. And then we'll come back and I'll show you how to weave it. But we're going to go into a quick break. So in Vera's Corner, Brian's going to give you some cookie tips. And then what are we making next? Next up, we are making a pull-apart milk bread wreath with dill. And those Ooh. herbs and flavors are going to be perfect, perfect on this table. Perfect with that. Yeah. So y'all come back. we got a lot to do. Vera's Corner is sponsored by Tax Slayer. It's your refund, go get it. It's holiday time, which means it's time to bake cookies. Brian Hart Hoffman, the editor-in-chief of Bake From Scratch, is here with five cookie tips. Don't overmix your dough. When creaming your butter and sugar, you'll want to spend the time beating it into fluffy goodness. But as soon as you add the flour, you should keep the mixing to a minimum. Every second spent beating your cookie dough at this point will activate more gluten, creating denser cookies. So keep this step short and stir in your mix-ins by hand so you don't overwork the dough. Refrigerate or freeze rolled out dough before cutting into shapes so that your dough is easy to cut but not too soft. Roll out your dough to the desired thickness and then refrigerate for 15 to 30 minutes before cutting into shapes. And refrigerate or freeze dough after cutting out shapes. Crisp, well-defined cookie shapes come from a final shock of cold, 15 to 30 minutes in the freezer or refrigerator. Bake one cookie batch at a time. If you're not in a rush, take the extra time to bake one sheet of cookies at a time, rotating halfway through. Store soft cookies separate from the crisp ones. When storing your cookies, make sure to keep your crunchy cookies in a separate container from your chewy cookies, or the moisture will soften up the crisp ones. Happy holidays and happy baking. Welcome back everybody and Brian, thank you for those tips. I love to help everybody and I love baking so I want to spread the joy. Well we did cookies on another show that you did with us so he really is an expert on that <laughs> as well as many other things about baking. So this is another recipe that's in one of your publications. So this is a Japanese milk bread wreath with dill. So stay with me for this, but it is in the upcoming <laughs> November, December issue. And we did a story in the magazine called Twas the Night Before Christmas. God, because one that thing title. that I love about the holidays is baking for my friends and family that I spend time right. with. But I don't want to wake up on Christmas Day bright and early to do it. There's too much other activities <laughs> right. going on. Presents. So this is a recipe you start the day before and it spends the night in the refrigerator and you bake it that next day. Oh. So we wanted to do something to solve the problem. Right. So this recipe is amazing. Well, you were very busy getting us to this point. There, yeah, there are a lot of steps, and I'll tell you what you do. So what makes the Japanese milk bread so famous is you start with a milk roux that's called a tangzong. And this is a milk paste where you combine milk and flour on the stovetop, and you just whisk until it's thickened. Mm -hmm. And it should register 149 degrees in temperature, and you let it cool completely. Okay. So this is that secret ingredient that makes the bread so tender and soft and why I love it. Then you heat milk until you have a reading of 110 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you combine that with your sugar and yeast. So you're blooming your yeast, and after 10 minutes, you should see a nice foam on the top of that mixture. That's how you know your yeast is active, and you're ready to start mixing everything else. So this... Well, let me suggest that one of these thermometers is really great with oh, all these things that you've mentioned. Always us. having an instant read right. thermometer in the kitchen really helps with bread baking, especially when right. you're heating liquids, and then again at the end when we check for the final temperature of the dough. So then, is another thing that's my favorite, is all 
all of it goes in the bowl of a stand mixer together. So I start by adding my yeast mixture. I add the um, flour, the milk roux, and then I start adding my melted butter, egg, dill, salt, and garlic powder mm. so that you get all the goodness in the bowl. Gosh. And then you use your paddle attachment to get everything combined. Now that's the attachment that some people decide to throw in the Now trash. listen, <laughs> the dough hook is the one that I think people throw away more frequently. Keep the attachments to your stand mixer. Exactly. You will need them. <laughs> so after combining everything with the paddle attachment, you switch to the dough hook and you knead your dough. So you start on a lower speed for about three minutes and then okay. you increase until you have a really smooth and soft dough. And that can take about six to eight yeah. minutes. Sometimes you have to add more flour. If mm -hmm. your dough is too sticky and you can't handle it, add a tablespoon at a time until your dough is smooth and it's not sticking to the sides of your bowl. So then you turn your dough out into a bowl that you've sprayed with cooking spray. You turn it and cover it and let it double in size. Okay, okay? where is that happening? So on that happens just on the counter okay. at room temperature. Okay. So then after your dough has doubled in size, you are gonna punch it down and you're gonna let it rest for five minutes. <laughs> are you with me? I promise you it's gonna be worth it. So here we are, the dough has been resting for five minutes, and now- Yeah, but you have it. No, but that's the baker's joy of working hard in the Isn't kitchen. Isn't it the truth? To have your favorite music on, just, you know, relax. So then you're gonna take your dough, and you're just gonna divide it into 20 equal portions. So using the sharp blade of a knife, or a bench scraper, I start just dividing into equal portions. So I know that I need 20 portions of dough. So I'm dividing this into four. So each of these will give me five. five. Okay, I'm, I, I math is not that. my strong suit, but I try really hard. Well, you know, I was a home ec teacher. So oh, all that's of this, right. I would have done it the exact same way. So Vera, I'm gonna let you start shaping these okay. into our balls that we are going to place on the sheet tray that we have a one and a half inch cutter. Okay. So we wanted to do this in a pull apart style wreath, keeping with the holiday yes. theme, but you could do this in any shape you want or just even I mean, in like a square. like a Christmas tree. Yeah, that would be great too. So when you're shaping your dough, yeah. you can just pull it to the bottom and get a nice round smooth top pinch the bottom, and you're gonna place six of these portions around the center, and then as we continue to shape, you could even use your hands oh, to get- Oh, I love that Yeah, technique. I'll show you out okay. here. So you can use your hands to get a nice, round, smooth ball, just by okay. using the tension of the surface. So that's another shaping method. And then you just do this all the way around. And then now is the part where we get to put it in the refrigerator and forget about it. Okay. So I have one here that spent the night in the refrigerator after getting our dough completely around the ring. All right, well, we may have to finish the top of that during the break because we got to set this stuff up and let everybody see what it looks like. So we'll finish this, and when we come back, we're going to present everything beautifully for tips for the holidays, and then maybe we'll sample. Oh, we are definitely going to sample. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you back in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. Brian, look how good. It's, a, it's all done, and it uh, smells delicious. Well, and you said, let's create a meal. Let's create something that, you know, what did you say earlier? Um, the magic of Christmas or the night before well, Christmas? Just having a holiday or even just an autumn meal, this is like all the flavors and comfort you crave. All right, well, let's start, go walk through. I what start every meal with bread. I just sit down and reach for it. But when these milk bread wreath rolls came out of the oven, I gave them even more deliciousness. I brushed them with melted butter. I sprinkled them with everything bagel seasoning and then some more dill. So it is layered with delicious crunch and flavor and just the soft texture of that milk bread. And I hope you like the presentation, the wood and the copper. Just really oh, love great. that. Okay, then I gave you a little quick lesson on chicken pot pie and you said you didn't really like to make pies. <laughs> so he bared with me, but honestly, we had fun making the I lattice. Had a blast. It was great, but it's our little secret here. We used all chicken breasts, white meat today. And then he and I both said, you know, I love the dark meat. I do. So it's wonderful with dark meat, too. And I love the Jed Curtis pan. Okay, so let's talk about this bunt cake. Okay. You might have asked me during the break, I think, what makes it the donut? Yeah. Well, when it comes out of the oven, I glazed it with 
a beautiful, just simple glaze of confectioner sugar and more apple cider. And then I sprinkled cinnamon sugar on top. And as it got crispy, it gets crunchy. And that outside is like an old fashioned donut. And then you can see the chunks of apple in the cake and that steam oven. You I, sold me. It, the texture of this cake is amazing. Well, and that perfect crown in the top. And I think it's the fact that the moisture comes through. So honestly, for me, there's so many uses for that piece of equipment Absolutely. from you know just incorporating more moisture into it. Well the pan like you said is beautiful and the glaze itself and I think you gave the tip there that if that glaze starts hardening so if you'll do a section. Just a, yeah if you see that it's you know drying quickly on the cake just start sprinkling with that cinnamon sugar and work your way around and you can see it just it, it's so beautiful you want to dive right in. Know. Well you know I said that this the third time was a charm and Brian was on this time for the third time. So we've got so many things that we're doing together. I want you to follow Brian on all his social media channels and be sure that you listen out for what he's doing. He's constantly recreating himself. He's such a great educator and Thank a you. mentor to young people especially. But you know, we've got the recipes on our website. No matter what you do, do it in good taste. Let's taste it's it. Time to dive and I in. want you to come back with us next week.